When Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin prepared to leave the moon, every system on the lunar module had already done its job, except one. The descent engine had landed them safely. The life support systems had kept them breathing. But to get home, one final mechanism had to work flawlessly. The ascent propulsion system. There was no backup, no redundant engine waiting in reserve, no second chance. If it didn't fire, two men would remain on the moon, entombed in the sea of tranquility. At that moment, the fate of Apollo 11 rested on a rocket engine weighing barely 180 pounds. It was, quite literally, the most unforgiving ignition sequence in human history. NASA's instructions to Grumman were absolute. Build a spacecraft that could launch itself from the moon, reach lunar orbit, and rendezvous with the command module using a single start pressure-fed engine. No turbo pumps, no spark igniters, no restart capability. The engine had to deliver about 3,500 pounds of thrust and burn for roughly 435 seconds, producing a smooth, controllable acceleration that would lift the 10,300-pound ascent stage clear of the surface and place it into orbit. It would have to start once, and only once, after sitting in a vacuum for nearly two days while the lunar surface baked and froze between minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit and plus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. NASA turned to Bell Aerosystems, already known for the Agena and Gemini attitude control thrusters, and asked them to create an engine that could never, under any circumstance, fail to ignite. Bell's engineers understood that every moving part was a liability. So they designed the Ascent Propulsion System, the APS, to be as simple as physics would allow. The APS was pressure-fed, helium gas stored at 3,400 pounds per square inch, forced propellants directly into the combustion chamber. No rotating machinery, no pumps, just tanks, lines, and valves. Its propellants were Aerozine 50, a 50-50 blend of hydrazine and unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine, and nitrogen tetraoxide. They were hypergolic, meaning they ignited on contact. That single chemical property eliminated an entire class of potential failures. When the astronauts flipped the ascent engine arm switch, solenoid valves opened, helium surged into the tanks, and the two propellants met inside the injector plate. Instant ignition. No spark plugs, no TEE-TEB torch, no separate starter system, nothing to misfire. The only things that had to work were two valves and the laws of chemistry. The APS's helium system was a masterpiece in miniature. Inside the ascent stage sat a spherical titanium tank about two feet across, wrapped in Inconel wire for strength. It held helium at 3400 psi, regulated down to roughly 245 psi for propellant feed. A small pyrotechnic valve opened to release the gas. Once fired, it couldn't be closed again. 
that was fine. The engine would never need a second start. Because the lunar module operated in a vacuum, Bell's engineers had to ensure that the helium didn't freeze the lines as it expanded. They installed heaters, thermostats, and redundant thermostatic switches to keep everything within a safe range. When armed, that tiny helium sphere became the beating heart of the entire ascent system, silent, invisible, and utterly vital. To lift off, the ascent stage first had to cut itself free from the descent stage. It wasn't a graceful process. Explosive gliotine cutters severed electrical harnesses, propellant umbilicals, and structural struts. A sequence of 12 shaped charge devices fired within milliseconds, each one triggered by the LM's master separation logic. Only after those connections were gone could the ascent stage move. Then came the briefest pause, less than a heartbeat, followed by the ignition command. A muffled thud, a push in the back, and 3,500 pounds of thrust began driving the ascent stage upward at about 0.3 g, slowly increasing as fuel mass dropped. Buzz Aldrin's description was understated. A sharp jolt, and we were flying. On Earth, the same engine would barely lift a small car. On the moon, it was enough to lift two men, their spacecraft, and humanity's hopes. The APS combustion chamber was built from niobium C-103, a refractory metal alloy that could withstand over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit without melting. Its shape was hemispherical, chosen to minimize stress and weight. To avoid complex plumbing, Bell used film cooling. A thin sheet of unburned fuel flowed along the inner wall, protecting it from heat and vaporizing into the exhaust. This allowed the chamber to survive its entire 435-second burn without regenerative cooling. At the top sat the injector plate, hundreds of precisely drilled orifices, each smaller than a pinhead, arranged to mix oxidizer and fuel in a fine spray. The pattern had to be perfect. An uneven spray could cause a local hotspot and destroy the engine. The finished assembly weighed only 181 pounds. For comparison, that's less than the combined weight of an astronaut suit and portable life support system. Yet it produced enough thrust to lift the entire upper half of the lunar module off the moon and into orbit. NASA could never truly test an ascent engine in the conditions it would face on the moon. Every firing changed the hardware. Each valve actuation, each combustion cycle aged the system. To verify reliability, Bell conducted more than 600 ground tests using identical development units at the White Sands Test Facility in New Mexico. These tests were run in vacuum chambers and thermal environments approximating the lunar surface. The engineers gathered data on valve timing, chamber pressure, ignition delay, and thrust curves. They found the ignition delay averaged less than 0.04 seconds, effectively instantaneous. The result of all that testing wasn't confidence in any single engine, but in the process. Statistically, NASA calculated a 99.9% .9 probability of successful first ignition. That was the standard. One start, no second chance, 99.9% .9 
reliability. While the engine itself was relatively simple, the control electronics were elegantly designed. Two independent electrical circuits, known as A and B, carried the ignition command. Each circuit had its own relays, wiring paths, and switches, so if one failed, the other could still open the valves and initiate ignition. Either of the LM's two onboard computers could trigger ignition, the Primary Guidance and Navigation System, PGNCS, or the Abort Guidance System, AGS, which was developed by TRW as a backup. Both computers had independent sensors and flight programs to ensure mission safety. If the primary computer failed during a critical phase, such as takeoff from the lunar surface, the astronauts could flip a single switch to transfer control to the backup AGS computer. In theory, astronauts could even manually open the engine valves through hardwired circuit breakers if the automated systems failed. Every critical control path was designed with redundancy, except the engine itself. NASA's philosophy was to make the engine as flawless and reliable as possible, while allowing all supporting systems to fail gracefully and be backed up intelligently. This robust redundancy and manual override capability helped ensure engine ignition reliability in the lunar module's highly demanding environment. At 124 hours, 22 minutes mission time, after 21 hours on the surface, Armstrong and Aldrin powered up the ascent systems. Buzz verified helium pressure, nominal. Armstrong confirmed the circuit breakers. On Houston's call, he armed the engine. Ignition, Aldrin called out. A brief shudder passed through the cabin and the lunar horizon began to drop away. Telemetry in mission control showed chamber pressure exactly at target, 100 PSI, nominal. Guidance data confirmed perfect thrust alignment. 435 seconds later, the burn ended. The ascent stage coasted into a 46 by 9 nautical mile orbit, precisely on plan. The little engine had done it on its first and only try. In that moment, the ascent propulsion system became a quiet legend among flight engineers. Two missions later, the world saw how vital that reliability really was. When an oxygen tank exploded in the service module, Apollo 13 lost its main power and propulsion. The lunar module became a lifeboat. Its descent engine was used to adjust trajectory, but the ascent engine, though never fired, stood ready as a last resort. Controllers in Houston considered using it for an emergency burn to speed the crew's return, but there was a risk. The engine was certified for one ignition only. If it were used mid-flight and later failed when needed for lunar departure, future crews might face disaster, so they left it untouched. Still, even after days in freezing conditions, telemetry showed the engine's valves and helium system remained stable. That endurance proved Bell's design margin, a system that could survive extreme cold, radiation and vibration, then light perfectly when called upon. From Apollo 11 through Apollo 17, seven lunar modules used their ascent engines. Every one performed flawlessly. No misfires, no slow starts, no thrust fluctuations. 
Even Apollo 15's extended stay, with over 66 hours on the surface, caused no degradation. When David Scott and Jim Irwin lifted off from Hadley Base, their chamber pressure matched the data from Apollo 11 almost exactly. NASA engineers joked that the ascent propulsion system was the least exciting part of every mission, the ultimate compliment. By the end of the Apollo era, the little Bell engine had become the only major propulsion system in the program with a perfect flight record. Let's pause for a moment on what made that success possible. The Ascent Propulsion System, or APS, generated a thrust of about 3,500 pounds force in vacuum conditions. Its burn time was roughly 435 seconds. The propellant flow rate combined about 17 pounds per second of oxidizer and fuel. The mixture ratio of oxidizer to fuel by mass was about 1.6 to 1. The chamber pressure was close to 100 pounds per square inch. Its specific impulse was an impressive 311 seconds in vacuum. That's remarkable for a simple pressure-fed design. Each engine was hand-built and put through acceptance tests at Bell Aerospace's facilities in Buffalo and Niagara Falls. From there, they were shipped to Grumman in Bethpage for integration. The entire propulsion system, including tanks, plumbing, helium bottles, the engine, and valves, weighed about 2,200 pounds when fueled. This system took up the upper half of the lunar module structure, with the engine nozzle protruding just below the crew cabin floor. Inside the cabin, when the engine fired, the noise was more of a deep hiss rather than a roar. In the vacuum of space, the exhaust plume expanded instantly into a wide, transparent cone that gradually faded into the black sky. Every astronaut understood the stakes. Once the descent stage was jettisoned, there was no going back. If the ascent engine failed to ignite, there was nothing the crew could do. No rescue, no alternate system, no external ignition source. They would be stranded with only hours of oxygen remaining. That knowledge added a subtle tension to every lunar surface operation. Behind the calm voices and procedural checklists, each crew carried the same unspoken question, will it light? And every time, it did. When Apollo 17's Challenger lifted off in December 1972, Gene Cernan's words, let's get this mother out of here, were followed by Houston's calm reply, good ascent, Challenger. Seven ignitions, Seven perfect flights, a 100% success rate on an engine that could never be tested under actual flight conditions. <laughs>